Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's with a really nice example of a Hotchkiss portative light machine gun. This is one of the few light machine gun designs that was available and fairly widely purchased before World War I. It was developed in 1907. Essentially the Hotchkiss company wanted to have careful there, wanted to have a, a light machine gun counterpart to its Hotchkiss Heavy design. The Heavy would of course become the Hotchkiss Model 1914, one of the primary heavy machine guns of the First World War, used by the French Army and the American Expeditionary Force. But they wanted a lightweight version. This is about half the weight of a Hotchkiss Heavy gun. It's about 26 pounds. The Heavy is 52, plus the additional weight of its tripod. Um, this can be carried and operated by just one person. Ideally you have two running it, one person to help load, one person to actually do the shooting. Um, there was a lot of interest in these guns when they first came out in 1907, 8, 9, 1910, up to World War I. A lot of Euro European major powers looked at these tentatively and with some curiosity. The British, the Germans, the French, the Belgians, Belgians the Russians, they all looked at them. No one was really quite sure how to use them. Nobody had a good tactical role in mind for these guns. And so there were a number of sort of small tentative orders. They found their way into use with cavalry forces, bicycle mounted troops, which was very much a thing, um, some aircraft use. In fact, the first machine gun air to air kill in World War I was made with a Hotchkiss portative in a French aircraft. But the only real significant military power that bought these, and actually we weren't a really a significant military power at the time, we were kind of like a cowboy army, uh, was the United States. The US adopted this as the Model 1909 Binet Mercier uh, light machine gun, and proceeded to not build all that many of them at Colt and Springfield. And we had so few they actually all stayed in the US during World War I, they were used for training and never actually deployed. The biggest ultimate use of these was by the British. Uh, the British adopted them um, right on the cusp of World War I. They were in, what is it, the British adopted them I think in 1915. Uh, tested them in 14, adopted them in 15, put them into production in a new Hotchkiss factory in the UK that took a lot of time to get up and running, um, and ultimately would use them extensively as tank mounted guns. And so that's how you'll often see them. This is sort of the original intended form with a wooden buttstock bipod out at the front instead of the weird British crow's foot tripod. Anyway, if you want a whole history on the Hotchkiss Portative uh, and its original development, I suggest the CN Arsenal video, which I'll link to in the description text below. They go into a lot of the background of this. What I want to do today is first show you a couple details of this gun, because this is how the Hotchkiss Portative was supposed to be sold. The British tank version is sort of a, a side path, um, because it was convenient for the British and it worked well in tanks. This is how the gun was intended to be used. Um, this is a South American contract gun. I'm not sure exactly what country. There were a lot of small orders throughout non-huge non, uh, military powers in Europe, in Asia, in South America. Um, the Brazilians and the Chileans both bought portatives, although this isn't either one of those. Both of theirs have identifiable crests on them. This one might be Costa Rican, it might be Mexican. I'm really not sure. But it is in 7mm Mauser, which is a pretty common South American cartridge at the time. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at a couple of the details, and then we're going to do a complete teardown on this, which is something that very few people have actually shown on the web, including my own previous video on the Hotchkiss about 10 years ago. So I figured this is a good time to update it. So let's dig in. Let's start out at the muzzle. The bipod on this thing is terrible. So normally you want to be able to lean into, or at least pull back on, a bipod, and this just folds completely up front or back. So I've had it rather precariously balanced here on camera. Um, it can fold. If we pop that, it will fold up. And in this position it's at least out of the way. Um, this one's kind of cool in that there are these little clip-in sockets on the side of the handguard to hold the bipod feet in position. So I mean I'd rather have a bipod that worked well when it was in use rather than one that just stowed conveniently, but something's better than nothing. The barrel on this gun is very aggressively textured. Um, that's something that was done on some of the US 1909 Benet Merciers, uh, and it was done to increase surface area on the barrel to improve uh, the cooling of the barrel. And you can see the back half of the barrel has a lot of thin fins on it for the same reason. 
It's interesting that this was done on this particular contract. Um, it's not something that lasted very long. People quickly realized that this is not worth the cost. It doesn't actually give you that much benefit and it's time consuming to do. Worth pointing out here, this is barrel 676 number one. So that's our serial number and that means it's the first of multiple barrels that were supplied with the gun. You can actually change Hotchkiss portative barrels pretty easily and we'll show that in a moment. This is gun number 676, so it's uh, all matching as far as I can tell. It is marked Mitrailleuse Automatique Portative Hotchkiss, so machine gun automatic uh, portable by Hotchkiss, caliber 7mm, that's 7x57 Mauser, uh, patented SGDG is a French abbreviation that basically means uh, the government guarantees the patent, but that doesn't mean it'll actually work. Like functioning is on the company, not on the government and a manufacture date of 1910, so a fairly early contract on these. In addition to the bipod on the front, we have a locking socket on the back here for a rear monopod uh, that would allow you to set the gun up uh, more or less supported. It's not as good as having a full tripod, but it would allow you more accurate long range fire. There is, there is a flip up shoulder rest here as well. The selector is one of the particularly clunky features of the Hotchkiss, aside from the stock, the bipod, and the feed system, which is like most of the gun at this point. But we've got three positions here. S is for safe, rotate it up one position for semi-auto, marked R for repetition, or full auto A for automatic. And then to charge the gun, you rotate it all the way over to that side and pull it back. And you've got this rather long spindly rod that runs all the way down into the receiver. So cock it back and then you pull this in and rotate it back to your semi safe or full auto firing position. So the bolt is now cocked and you'd be ready to actually feed in a feed strip. This uses the same style of feed strip as the Hotchkiss model 1914. This is actually one in 8 Lebel, so it's not going to fit our 7mm gun, but um, this is the same style of feed strip. Now on the Hotchkiss heavies, you load the strip with the cartridges on the top. On this, you load the strip with the cartridges underneath, so it would go in this direction. Like I said, this isn't going to fit because the cartridges are bigger and the spacing is a little different. But you have your feed tray here, and you would take a strip and slide it right in there. For what it's worth, uh, metallic feed strips are not really any slower than belts when you have a proper machine gun crew, where you have one guy whose whole job is just keeping an eye on this and keeping it fed. Uh, these strips are also a lot less susceptible to moisture, humidity, rot, deterioration. Um, they're generally more durable. Uh, feed systems than cloth belts. Now these would very much go out of style when we get metallic uh, belts, you know, individual metallic links that kind of do all the, have all the benefits of strips and of cloth belts. But for the pre-World War I period, this is a reasonable feed system. Although it's not great, especially with the rounds held upside down, um, you do have the possibility if you're reusing a feed strip that it'll have gotten worn and the cartridges will fall out under recoil. But as long as you've got good proper new feed strips, uh, if you're shooting one of these yourself, uh, recommend steel strips over brass because um, they're a little more resilient. Anyway, we'll get into the operation of the feed system a little bit more in a minute. Note that we do have our rear sight up here, slightly offset on the gun, basically because the stock has to be really awkwardly set up because the charging handle has to come back into this space. Uh, it's a very clumsy gun. One of the interesting things to me is that when Hotchkiss decided to make a lightweight alternative or counterpart to their Model 1900 heavy gun, they gave it a completely different method of operation. The same feed strips, uh, the same gas system, but the lockup is totally different. On the Hotchkiss heavy, you have a tilting block that just drops into a locking uh, recess. On this, it locks with what's called a firmature nut. So if you look inside there, you can see a set of interrupted threads. And there's another one of them right here. There's actually three sets of, uh, of five locking lugs each on a rotating nut inside the action here. When I pull the trigger, this is that nut having actually rotated up. Normally when we have interrupted threads working as a, a rotating locking system, 
we expect the bolt to be the part that rotates. In this, it's actually essentially the receiver element that rotates. So that makes this a really fairly unique and unusual system. Now with the bolt closed, we can start our disassembly, and I'm going to do that by lifting the charging handle up, and then I pull it a little bit back clockwise, and the whole charging handle is going to come out of the gun and kind of wiggle off to the side. So that's the charging handle. It's got a little hook up here at the front that it uses to actually hold the front of the bolt carrier to pull it back when you're cycling the gun. And then the selector mechanism is based on these cutouts right here, which I'll show you in just a moment. The next disassembly step is pretty easy. I'm going to take this pin and unscrew it. It is not captive, so we'll just lose that now. And then I take the whole lower assembly here, I'm going to push it forward and bring it off the gun. And we do have the main spring in there, but it's not under that much tension. So that is our lower assembly and fire control system. This is actually a kind of interesting fire control system. So th this is connected to the trigger. When I pull the trigger, it's not pivoting, it's just pulling laterally back. And you can see how it's pulling this arm, which drops this sear. When this goes down, it releases the bolt, the bolt goes forward, and subsequently fires. Now, in order to control for safe, semi, or full auto, these cutouts block or don't block this tab at the back of the trigger. So on safe, this is just blocked and it can't come back. Safe, right? Easy. On semi-auto, this comes back, but we have a cutout here that's a little shallower, and so it takes the end of this tab and pulls it down, which at the end of travel forces the, the nose of the trigger to go up, which acts as a disconnector. So it releases that lever, which pops the sear back up, and thus you only get one shot. In full auto, there's a bigger cutout right there, and so the trigger can just pull back and stay pulled back until you release it. So that's how the trigger mechanism works on this. The next job is to reach in there and grab the bolt and bolt carrier, but they're currently locked in position here, and it takes a decent bit of force to unrotate this fermature nut and actually unlock the thing and get the bolt out. And the easiest way to do that really is just to thread this charging handle back in, rotate it around like you're using it to cock the gun. <clears throat> Come on. There we go. And pop everything out. So there is our bolt, bolt carrier, and utterly absurdly massive gas piston. Take that off. That's the firing pin. That's also pretty chunky. That's unlikely to break. One thing about Hotchkiss guns, they tend to be durable. You'll notice there's a very large amount of material around the breech face there, and that's because the portative was offered in a number of different calibers, including 8mm Lebel for the French. And 8mm Lebel has a very large rim that requires a lot of space in a bolt face. So they made it big enough for essentially the biggest cartridge they might have to deal with, and then smaller cartridges like 7mm Mauser, well, you've just got a big... Uh, rim around the outside of the bolt face, which doesn't hurt anything. The most important operative part of the portative is this bolt carrier and gas piston, because it actually controls everything else that's happening. So we have a camway here that rotates the fermature nut, which you'll see in a moment. We have two tracks here that operate the feed system, which you'll see in a moment. This is our sear surface, so this is what holds the bolt back and then releases it to fire. And then the firing pin is actually held by the bolt carrier right here, inside the bolt. So you can see how that's accessible down there. And when the bolt's not in battery, this is cammed off to the side, which prevents it from protruding forward and firing. Once the bolt goes all the way forward, of course, this is pushed forward by the bolt carrier, 
firing pin protrudes out, and the gun fires. So that's how it normally sits. This is going to rotate over, the, fire, the bolt carrier goes all the way forward, fires a cartridge like that. When it comes back, a cam in the top of the receiver is going to push the firing pin back over into this safe side position. Now that's as far as you normally see a portative disassembled, but we are going to carry on. So this uh, locking screw locks this nut in position over the receiver. Essentially what we have here is our barrel connects to this nut through a series of uh, interrupted threads. This nut locks to the receiver with a series of regular threads. The furniture nut is locked inside the receiver. So this piece right here is the operative component that holds everything else together. Now there is a wrench that locks into these two slots uh, to allow you to open this up fairly easily. I don't have that, and you can see nobody else in this gun's history has either. So I'm just going to tap this open with a little brass punch. But first, lest I forget, we're going to take the bipod off, and all I have to do to remove it is pull this spring-loaded ring forward, and that lifts right off its mounting peg. All right, with that barrel nut unscrewed, uh, the barrel will now come off the front. It's going to be a little tight because the lower handguard here is held in place there too. And there we go. So there are the interrupted threads that hold the barrel into this piece. This, right? If I unscrew this just slightly to clear the handguard, I can pull this off. It's just a sheet metal handguard. It covers the gas plug down here, and it protects your hand from the moving gas piston inside. Now we've got a really relatively small piece of material to work with at last, and I can take this, and now I can just easily unscrew it by hand. So that comes off. Threads on the front of the receiver, threads on the inside of this nut, interrupted threads here to lock into the barrel. And then this is the rotating nut that locks into the bolt. So the bolt is going to come forward like this. This furniture nut then rotates counterclockwise just enough so that all of the interrupted threads line up and lock in place. So it's a little hard to show this without the receiver holding all the bits in place, but essentially as this comes back like so, it locks, and when it goes forward it's going to rotate to unlock. There we go. Okay, so now you can see as the bolt carrier goes forward this locks, and as it comes backward it unlocks the bolt from the nut. Really an unusual system, because we're, we're used to the bolt being the part that actually rotates, not this random loose nut inside the receiver. All right, next up we can get to the feed system. We have this. This big thing is actually a flat spring that puts pressure on the feed pawls. It's a really weird component to have on the outside of the gun, but there it is. So I can lift this tab off of this cam right here, and then I can pull this whole spring out. There we go. There's the spring for the feed system. Now with that removed, you can see this pawl a little better. And what this thing is actually going to do is rotate in and out and pull the feed strip in. So the strip comes in this side and pushes across that way as you fire. And if you look at the front of this finger, you can see that it's angled here, sharp on that side. So when it rotates this direction, it lifts up over a stop in the feed strip, and then it rotates this way and pushes the strip in. So back, forth, and it is acting on these cutout stops in the strip. So it's going to lift up here, lock onto that one, push the strip in one position. Lift up, lock on there, push the strip in one position. Up, 
and so on. With the feed spring removed, I can take this and actually lift it out of the gun. Come on. There we go. So there's, there's your feed pawl. No springs in it at all. It's controlled by these two mechanical cams, which run on these two surfaces of the side of the gas piston. So it's running on these two. When it gets to the back, it's going to lift up here. When it gets to the front, it's pushing it over. So you can see a slope there and a slope there. And that's what rotates the feed pawl. Now this spring is always pushing down on this cam, so that's what keeps it uh, firmly in contact with the feed strip. And it has one other function as well, which is if there's no feed strip in place, this drops down lower than normal and it actually prevents the bolt from going forward. So this locks open when there's no feed strip in place, which is good because it means you don't have to recock the gun when you put a new strip in. You just put the strip in, that act lifts this up, makes it ready to fire. It is a pain in the butt for manually processing the gun, because if you want to dry fire it you have to remember to pop this up manually each time that you're attempting to dry fire it. One other interesting little feature here, you can see that little silver round button right there, that is actually a loaded chamber, or a loaded strip indicator. When, when there's a strip in place it pushes that little plunger out, so in theory you can see that you have a cartridge all the way in the feed system ready to go. Um, then lastly, this finger slides in between the feed strip on top and the cartridge on the bottom right here. So that's where it's lined up. Again, this one's not going to fit because it's a larger caliber than the gun's built for, but that slides in right here. And that thing's job is to actually pop cartridges out of the feed strip and drop them down into the feedway ready to be chambered by the bolt. All right, at long last there is your fully stripped Hotchkiss Portative. Um, not quite as many parts in there as you might think, and there's some pros and cons here. Like it's a, an incredibly awkward gun to use, it's a very expensive gun to make. Imagine the number of machine operations required for, say, this bolt. Or more to the point, this receiver, even though some of this stuff, you can see some rivets here, some of these pieces are riveted on as separate assemblies, but still this is incredibly expensive and time consuming to manufacture. You did have, well, before I move to other options, um, the one good thing I will say about this is there's nothing really fragile here. Like this is the closest thing you have to a fragile part, and I'm not aware of any reports of these things breaking. Um, if you really ganked on it you could probably bend it, but things like the firing pin is very robust. This uh, feed system cam, that's super robust. It may be on the outside of the gun, which is dumb, but you're not going to break it. Um, even the exterior flat spring, this is a very large spring. There's a lot of surface area to it and it's unlikely to break either. So Hotchkiss did some things right and some things wrong on this gun. Um, Overall, you could have also gotten a Madsen light machine gun at this same time period, and personally I would take the Madsen a thousand times uh, before a Hotchkiss portative. But there were plenty of countries that did opt for the portative, and these did see service in World War I, especially with the British, and they did fulfill their job. My experience shooting the Hotchkiss portative is primarily from the collaboration I did with CN Arsenal, uh, Project Lightning, where we tested a bunch of World War I light machine guns. And my conclusion is essentially that it's a mechanically not a bad gun, but completely let down by its handling and ergonomics. It's a really clumsy, awkward gun to work with. Now this version is actually better than the British pattern that we used in Project Lightning. The British pattern makes a number of compromises ergonomically in order to better work in an armoured vehicle. This is set up to actually be used from the bipod in the field. But still the loading process is clunky, this is very susceptible to getting junk in it, dirt, mud, you name it. It's like they built a machine gun with all the inside bits on the outside. Um, it's hard to hold, it's hard to charge, it's hard to load, it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, Hotchkiss would end up improving this design, like dramatically improving this design, to a series of 1920s patterns. They have a 1922, a 24, a 26. They would continue to market a light machine gun uh, internationally, and they actually got, again, a fair number of sales in the 1920s 
never with first tier military forces, but with a lot of, I guess you could call them second or third tier countries, that wanted to buy some guns, didn't have any domestic production, and they look to a notable big name company like Hotchkiss in France that has various designs on the market. And uh, so those Hotchkiss 1920s patterns, that's another one that we'll do a video on at some point coming up here. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this, hopefully you enjoyed seeing it actually torn down to all its component parts. Uh, big thanks to Morphe's for being the best source of uh, collectors machine guns out there and having this one on hand for us to take a look at. Thanks for watching.